The Conjuring 3. So The Conjuring is probably one of my favorite horror movie franchises. Probably the whole universe, you know, The Conjuring universe, I would say. But this latest entry, we have Patrick Wilson and Vera Farmiga coming back as Ed and Lorraine Warren. And they're battling not just demons and battling for people's souls. They're also battling the U.S. government in court. So because this movie is actually based off of a true story where we did have, you know, the character Arnie actually kill somebody and actually go to court. Does this new, you know, spin to the to the entry for as far as the Conjuring series? Does it add something fresh? Does it fall flat? Let's break it down and talk about it. So the first thing I want to talk about was the opening sequence. So just like in other Conjuring movies, you know, there's usually some type of like opening sequence or intro kind of sort of to kind of lead you up and then they kind of gray out the screen and give you some type of like scroll kind of like star wars like a star wars movie kind of like set the premise story-wise of what's to come and i think with this conjuring movie i mean they give you action right off the bat you know we're thrown right into the exorcism of david the little boy he's i think eight years old we're thrown right into that and you can see that there's been all this you know turmoil and action and, and damage to the house and all the stuff being thrown around and people are tired and just all this kind of crazy stuff going on and i just think it's really just you know, that they gave it to you all up front in the movie, like like setting the stage for this is what the movie is going to be like. And I think it's a different, you know, pace compared to the other movies, you know, especially the first and second entry and even some of the other, you know, movies in the, you know, the Conjuring universe. So I really enjoyed the opening sequence and it kind of just, it was like, dang, they just gave it to me right off the bat and I, and I loved every minute of it. So like I said in kind of my intro, I feel like this, The Conjuring 3 is trying to add something fresh to the other Conjuring movies since this is the third sequel and I guess what's supposed to be like a trilogy, they're trying to, you know, keep things fresh. You know, a lot of times horror movies, they typically stay with the same type of formula, but sometimes creators kind of throw something in to make it kind of new and interesting to keep, you know, viewers coming back. So with this one, it's, you know, the aspect of this guy commits a murder, he's going to court and he says, oh, well, the devil made me do it or, you know, a demonic possession made me do the kill. Well, that's something totally different. So now this movie turns into, you know, as I've seen people say, Law, like a Law and Order meets The Conjuring or, you know, Law and Order Possess Demons Unit, maybe? Uh, maybe it'll catch on. Or Possess Victims Unit? Maybe that'll catch on. We'll see. I'm waiting for that spinoff. Vera Farmiga's Lorraine match with Mariska Hargitay. I think that would be a, a good seller. But nonetheless, I think that's actually a very interesting thing. I mean, they play detective a lot anyway. I mean, the first one with the found family, they, they, you know, they do some digging into the archives about the house to find out about the witch. And um, even the second one, they, you know, do some digging to find about, about the guy that used to live at the house, but those are really like small scale. And in this one, it's kind of a true feels more like a detective cop show where they're actually going out, you know, to crime scenes, to morgues, you know, they're, they're doing all the stuff you usually see in like a law and order episode, which I think is interesting. And it does make it kind of fun and new and something that we haven't seen yet in the Conjuring movies. So compared to the first two films where we usually have a victim that's, you know, runs into some type of possession with a demon and it's usually the warrants that have to come and save them and do some type of exorcism to get them saved. This time around, we actually have a little bit of both. So we have a cult, Disciples of the Ram, that basically have this, this one person, at least the main antagonist of the movie, kind of seen more behind the scenes up until the very, you know, last few acts of the movie known as the occultist or the witch whichever you want to call her and she curses people to basically meet the requirements for an overall big curse to release a demon so it's kind of confusing a little bit when you watch the movie to kind of get what's going on truly but as you'll learn the overall curse is you have someone of purity someone of love and someone of faith and so this woman is basically trying to curse somebody in each of those categories to commit a murder and then commit suicide. And once they've done that, she's met the requirements to basically release a demon or give us, you know, give these souls to a demon to come into the real world. And if she does not meet the requirements, then the demon will come and take her soul. That's basically what it comes down to. Now, what I think is interesting is because this person's a living being, not a demon, she's a live person, you can feel, touch, see, etc. This is something new for the franchise. Because up until this point, they've been dealing mostly with dead people and demons. So now we actually have a person who is invoking these things to happen to other people, giving us kind of two different things in one, which I think is great. So the Conjuring 3 overall is really giving us demons, cults, and law and order all in one, which is new stuff that we haven't seen before. So one thing I wanted to also talk about was there's more bone cracks than less scares. Now, what I mean to say is this movie seems to do little things a little bit different. So it relies less on jump scares, 
you know, which is what the other two movies have, have done. And, and even the gory appearance of demons, you know, like in the first one with, with the witch, you know, she's very grotesque looking and, and it was, you know, not, it was very unsettling to look at her. But I think with this one, we have more of when people are possessed, they're, they're kind of doing more of, you know, the exorcism of Emily Rose, relaxed exorcism kind of thing where we have the victims being contorted into, you know, doing twists and turns and back bends and putting themselves into pretzels and doing things that you would normally not be able to do with your body and creating these bone cracks. And it's just, it's kind of like nails on the chalkboard kind of thing. It's just kind of unsettling to hear and it makes you kind of cringe and squirm and, you know, there's more of that. And then there's also more unexpected things that are more thrilling. Like when, you know, there's this fat dead body that's chasing Ed and he's, he does it more than once, but it's just very unsettling to see because you're, I mean, he's a very big guy and he could definitely take out Ed and he's obviously possessed this dead body. And so it's just stuff like that. And that's not so much what they've already kind of been accustomed to as far as having stuff thrown across the room. I guess the way to say it is in the opening sequence, they kind of gave us stuff that we've seen in all the previous movies, right? So in this one, they're trying to give us more new stuff. And I feel with what they've done, it, they've done a good job and I like it. So I like having all of the other aspects we've known to see in the first two films plus these kind of new new things. And also with us having a live victim or having a living villain, you know, we get more of the just straight murder aspect where this person kills people and can kill the you know, our our protagonists and our heroes. So all those things together are something new and unique that we haven't seen previously in other in other conjuring films. <laughs> so then the next thing I'm talking about is Super Lorraine. So I feel like this movie has done a really good job of showcasing Lorraine as far as her, her abilities and powers and just putting her kind of in the forefront. Yes, Ed is there. That's her partner in crime, their husband and wife. But, you know, in this movie, he kind of takes a back scene, I feel like a little bit and is more of a victim because he is, they are older in this movie. You know, this is 10 years after the first one. So I think when I looked it up, they were, they're like in their mid to late fifties in this movie. And so, I mean, they're a little older and he's, you know, he does have a heart attack. So he's, you know, not as in motion as he is in past movies. He's kind of out of pocket. A little bit um but i think with this one it, it makes it to where lorraine shines a lot there's i love the part where they're they're going to the well there's actually several scenes but the ones i remember the most is where they're with the detective the cop and they're in the kind of interrogation room and he puts three knives in front of her and asks her to pick which one was actually used in the murder of whatever lorraine and ed are there to, to investigate and she picks the right knife and he's like oh best one out of three and then they're driving, and then there's, you know, they hear Elvis Presley play on the radio. He's like, did you ever talk to Elvis? He's like, I met him before and after. And he kind of just looks at her like, really? And then, you know, it's in the back smirking. Uh, I also think that this is the first time we've actually seen, you know, Lorraine's really good about using her, her abilities and visions to touch things or ob uh, touch people or objects to kind of give her the story of what's going on. So, like, in the second one, we kind of go through the Amityville a little bit, you know, where she's you know, reenacting with a shotgun and shooting the people and all that kind of stuff to kind of relive what happened to see what, what, what really happened. So in this one, it's kind of the same thing, except with our, you know, our new villain, she also seems to have these kind of capabilities with the demonic powers that she's invoking. So she's kind of meets her in this kind of connected world and is able to, you know, caress her and make her fearful. And, you know, the connection goes both ways, as Lorraine says, which is very interesting because we haven't seen that before. So, I like this overall that we have kind of like a super Lorraine and she's doing these really cool things and is is more of the main hero of the movie. So next thing I want to talk about was the editing and flow of the movie. So I, for me personally, I was able to follow the majority of the movie throughout the whole part. Like I wasn't really too confused, but there were some scenes I do agree with. I did watch this as a second time as a watch along with Grace Randolph and the Beyond the Trailer community. Highly recommend you join that community. They're really great. But I noticed a lot of people really confused with the flow of the movie and I think it had to do with like the cut scenes. I think this movie was trying to uh, was trying to do things like have things happen maybe in parallel, or you know go between real world, not real world, or real world and like vi like dream stuff like that. And I think when they do those kind of edits, it was really confusing to know who was doing what or when was this happening or where was this happening stuff like that. For the most part, I got it, but I could I could see in some instances where viewers could get confused. And I think that maybe if there was an uncut version of this movie, that would probably not be an issue. Uh, you'll have a little bit of comments what you think about that. If you think that this movie, if you were able to follow it all the way through, or if you agree with me that maybe 
there was some editing done that did make it seem a little bit choppy with the flow. Um, or if you think an uncut version would, would, would be better as far as telling the story more fluidly. Like I said, I think I followed it for the most part, but you'll have to let me know in the comments below if you've seen it, if you agree with some of the people's qualms about it. So will there be a Conjuring 4? Now, I, I think with this one, there was supposed to be a end credit scene that basically set up the premise for a Conjuring 4, but it was deleted, sad to say, so I guess we'll have that as bonus features on the, the DVD or the Blu-ray. Um, but I will say that I think originally this was supposed to be a trilogy. I think that Patrick Wilson and Vera Farmiga were not really intending on coming back for a fourth one. That's not to say that this movie does really well at the box office or even on HBO Max that Warner Brothers couldn't persuade them to come back for a fourth one because there are tons of stories to tell in the Conjuring universe. I do think though that this movie did seem to have like a lot of closure to it. So just with like all the other Conjuring movies, it's it's not just a movie about them and their stories as far as the possession and the demons and saving the victims. It's also about their love as a couple together. And with every movie that we see, we always get to see that their love is strong and remains strong and the love they have for each other. So, you know, especially in this one, they were like doing some things where like, dang, they're like a power couple. You know, I was like, oh, that's so sweet, you know? So that me and my wife would hopefully, you know, do stuff like that as we get older. So I think with that, I, would people want to see a Conjuring 4? I think absolutely. These movies seem to happen in three year spans, like between the first and second one is three years and this one. So I think if we give it another, some more time, Maybe they'll say, oh, yeah, I'll do a Conjuring 4. And if the story is good enough, I'm sure they may come back. I do have some ideas for what they could possibly do for a Conjuring 4. Uh, I'm going to try to talk about that in a separate video. But nonetheless, I do think that there is always room for the Conjuring 4. And I think if they kind of continue on this style of having new and interesting things to add to the mix, because we know that they did a whole lot more than just do straight exorcisms and save possessions by, you know, they, they did stuff like this. So if they keep building upon this, I think that the conjuring four would be interesting, especially if it's another formidable foe we haven't seen yet. So should you watch the conjuring three? Absolutely. I think if you're a horror movie fan, conjuring fan, I think if you just want to simply watch something and get a little scared because there's tons of times to do that, this is going to be the movie for you to watch this weekend. And if I had to give it a rating, I would give it four and a half out of five stars. I would give it four out of five stars. I was trying to think of what I could do for like, you know, a set of stars or, you know, thumbs up or something like what I could do, but oh, I, I know I could do four and a half out of five Lorraine's. Let's just do that. Four out of five for me, for me get Lorraine's. Let's try that. So I, that's, I think it's not perfect by any means. I think there are some things about it that people are going to have problems with, but I think to me, it's probably compared to the first one, it's probably the second strongest Conjuring film in the franchise. So with that below, what do you think about my review? Do you agree with some of the points I've made? Do you think there should be Conjuring 4? Love to hear your thoughts down below. And that's it for this video, guys. If you enjoyed, hit that like button. For more like this one, make sure you subscribe to the channel. And I'll see you guys next time on the mashup.